So it remains to introduce Sarah Maitland, um, who is a novelist, short story writer, contemplative um, thinker. She's um, deep in the middle of her fantastic A Book of Silence. No, you're um, deep in the middle of her, I think she is. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's tremendous, it's terrific, um, and um, not forgetting The Moss Witch, which has just come out and just been, we've heard of the press, um, long listed for the Franco O'Connor Short Story Award. So I don't know what Sarah's going to be talking about, but um, if we could give a rising round of applause. Such a, after two such distinguished writers, I didn't want to have too much repetition, although I don't think that's very likely because we're rather different sorts of writers. And anyway, Louis didn't say anything, so that's <laughs> it. Um, can everybody hear? Can you hear at the back? Yeah. Um, I'd much rather not lose you use of mic, but if people can't, do say, because apparently we've got them. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I think that I use place or landscape or whatever you want to call it um, rather differently from either of them, um, partly because I never have to walk on the M25. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to say. Um, I'm going to begin by reading a little bit from Book of Silence because something happened to me which is very closely related to place, as you will see, about ten years ago. That completely changed my life. It didn't only change my life in practice, it changed what sort of writer I was. Um, before, um, before I found the house that I now live in, um, I was mainly a fiction writer and mainly a non-realist fiction writer. Um, but for a complicated series of reasons, which you can read about in Book of Silence if you want to, um, I got more and more interested in silence itself as a project, um, and living in E2 is not a very good place for such a pursuit. Um, so I was looking to move more rurally, um, in a quite sort of practical and pragmatic way. Um, but it's quite difficult for a single person with not very much money um, to find an extremely isolated house to live in. Um, because on the whole, the more isolated a house is in Britain, the bigger the house is. Because until there was... Uh, um, uh, good transport in rural areas. Um, such houses had to be increasingly, as you got further and further out, self-contained. So they had to be quite large. Um, so I was having great difficulty finding anywhere to live. Um, I grew up in southwest Scotland, and I was at the time that I'm going to read about now, living in southwest Scotland because my mother was dying, um, and so I was sort of there. What? So, um, while I was mulling all this over, something that retrospectively feels magical, even grace, happened. I'd been to look at a totally unsuitable house in the Maccas, the more easterly of the two Galloway peninsulas that stick down into the Irish Sea towards the Isle of Man. And later in the day, had an appointment to view another, also it turned out, totally unsuitable, house near Girvan in southern Ayrshire. It is hard to imagine any other pair of locations that would have caused me to notice on the map, to notice that on the map there was a little tiny road that ran north from the A75 to Bar Hill. I thought it would be a shortcut through pleasant rural countryside, pretty and convenient. So I headed up the Luce Valley. North of the village of New Luce, I entered a new world one that I had not known existed. A swathe of high moorland, and moreover, one that had not been taken over by modern forestry plantings. Here, the high hills only a few miles further east, which I'd walked in years before, were ground down by the glaciers of the last ice age, 
leaving the undulating peat and granite moors of my dreams stretching empty for miles. The land here is so infertile that it was left alone in the 19th century and is still liberally scattered with Bronze Age um, remains, which elsewhere were obliterated by enclosure and agricultural improvement. The road, single track with parking, passing places, wound its way up over singularly decrepit cattle grids and little bridges. The upper reaches of the crosswater of Luce, somewhere between river and berm, bubbling over stones or lying in long, still pools, wound serpentine down the shallow valley. And there was a huge nothing. Here, here was where I wanted to live. Like Antony, St. Antony the Hermit, like Antony, here was the place that fed my appetite for the absolute that would place me, as his wood and pond had placed Thoreau, in a naked condition in front of the universe. But when I got home and started asking around, it became clear that the chances of my finding a place to live up on that moor were effectively non-existent. There were very few houses in any case, and almost all of them were tenanted farmhouses, and the Stair Estate, which owned it all, had a policy of not selling land. They preferred levelling unused homesteads and expanding the few remaining hill farms. I tried to shrug my I tried to shrug my shoulders, and I went on looking. And just over a month later, for reasons that the local population still do not understand, I have to tell you we now do understand this was eight years ago, because they were in fact in negotiation with the largest on land wind farm in Britain, <laughs> <laughs> which is most unfortunate for me because I approve of wind farms. <laughs> uh, it's not very nice to meet your own inner NIMBY, actually. <laughs> um, for reasons we do, do not understand, the estate put two sites on the market. One was a substantial old farmhouse, and the other was its derelict little shepherd's house, nearly a mile away. In the days when hill farming was still profitable, most of the old farms had a farmer, and probably a couple of workers, but also a shepherd who lived further up where the sheep roamed freely. It gives me particular joy that the last person to shepherd here was Jock Welsh, the international sheepdog trial champion and judge. He was the person who did uh, One Man and His Dog on telly, <laughs> if any of you are old enough to remember this rather wonderful program. Um, anyway, he did his apprenticeship then. Um, the house was collapsing even when he was an apprentice, and when he got married, he and his wife Christine moved first into a caravan behind the house and later off-site. But it seems to me a noble heritage and gives me encouragement in my rather different trials. So of course I bought it. <laughs> and I bought it and I had to rebuild it. Um, we rebuilt it as new. <laughs> if you convert a house, um, you have to pay VAT, but you don't have to follow current planning restrictions. If you build as new, um, you don't pay any VAT on the build. <laughs> but you do have to have level floors and wheelchair access and all sorts of things. <laughs> so it was a kind of toss-up. The house was in exactly the condition that the council said I could choose, um, whether I wanted to do it as bring back into use or as a new build. Um, and I did it as new build because money seemed more important than wheelchair access to me at the time. Um, what happened? What happened when I went um, when I went to live there is that it turned me into a writer of place that recognising it in a very, I cannot tell you what a visceral level I recognised that place as what should be my home and it made me think a great deal about place and that since then I've written less fiction and the fiction I've written has been perhaps less magical realist and I've written more um, what we now call the new nature writing, um, non-fictional um, prose about place. So, um, and actually it's very nice. I also like living there very much. Um, it's very, very... It turned out about five years ago that everybody was an organic farmer. They hadn't known it, they had to make no alterations. Nobody had used any fertiliser because it wasn't worth it. Um, nobody had done anything bad. Somebody just turned up and said, you can have the organic premium if you register. Uh, very, very unusual. 
very, very tragic in lots of ways. It's an area still in decline and very, very beautiful and uh, very nature study, study really. Um, I went for a walk the other day and a half a mile along a, a road verge, I found 24 different species of flowers flowering. Um, it's very, very um, undeveloped. But it was more actually the emotional response to it that made me realise how important place was. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, I think, what I want to talk about today is how place functions more widely in creative writing and how I feel I respond, respond to that. Um, so, I, yeah, I'd sort of take it quickly, a quick historical look at this whole business of place in British writing because actually I believe there are two very, very different and really separate approaches to it. Um, in fact, there's more than two, and I'll probably come back to some of the others <coughs> later on. But the two I want to look at, um, look, before I say that, I want to say that for me, I have an absolute conviction based on no evidence whatsoever that a landscape informs cultural, not just but cultural imagination. So that for reasons, I won't even go into the reasons now, um, you get monotheisms always developing deserts that uh, Celtic and Northern European fairy stories differ profoundly because the former developed on coasts, seafaring people, and the latter developed in forests, which is what my book, Gossip from the Forest, <laughs> um, is about really. It's about why we get what the particular tropes of the kind of Grimm's type fairy story um, that come out of forests and why, why that's the case. Um, you, you, there's a number of other ways you get it, the, uh, mystical, mystical traditions, both the Buddhist meditation type and the more Christian ecstatic visionary type, always seem to develop in places with mountains. Um, and that the only, the only body of mythology I know that is so pessimistic that it doesn't believe that the gods will win in the end is the Viking myths, that Ragnarok is going to be expensive, even if victorious, and probably not. And I cannot believe that that does not come out of the intolerably long winters. <laughs> uh, it's got to. I mean, it's got to be a connection, hasn't it? Um, so, this conviction, which is not shared by most writers, gives a particular cultural resonance to how I feel about the place, um, to which I'd sort of add that places aren't just a set of views. They're a set of cultural formalities. I'm going to tell you one little thing. In my area, nobody speaks Gaelic, nobody's spoken Gaelic in the last two centuries, so everybody's speaking English. I come with a very marked Northern Irish accent, which is confusing, um, but it has some wonderful idiosyncrasies of its own, some of which are kind of well known. You don't live somewhere, you stay somewhere, which I, where do you stay, people say. And I say, no, no, I live here permanently. Um, but the one that I like best of all is the, I was driving along my car. Um, and all social interaction in my community takes place at these passing places. The road's so narrow, that's these little passing places. Then somebody stops and you talk out the windows of your car. It's a very, very good system. Um, so I say to Billy, who's an elderly farmer that I'm very fond of, and he's a Sabbatarian, he doesn't work on Sundays. Um, he's teetotal, but he's only teetotal while he's being an elder. <laughs> they have very old-fashioned Kirk, in which all the elders are teetotal. So you're not an elder for all your life, like you are in other parts of Scotland. When you get bored of being teetotal, you swap. <laughs> um, but at the time, he was being an elder. So, uh, anyway, I said, how are you, Billy? He said, oh, I'm coming out in November. <laughs> and I, was, I knew he didn't mean what I would have meant. I said, what it actually means is giving up your tenancy, retiring. If you give up your tenancy formally and legally, you come out. If you give up your tenancy negatively and sneakily, um, it's a different matter. Coming out is a very respectable thing to do. But well, I, my absolute impulse was to say, oh, does Mari know? <laughs> um, but that kind of, that is just a kind of top level. My son has a Spanish partner, and uh, he took her one day to the local um, sheep trial, actually, sheep dog trial, which were, which Jock Welsh comes down from his now Ayrshire, um, Sheep dog training centre um, to judge, because he was a lad there. Um, 
that it's the most chaotic event in the world. One of the reasons why it's chaotic is that each farmer gets to choose the sheep. You run eight, eight sheep, a little group of sheep. You have to put through gates and your dog has to do all these things. But they actually choose the sheep for each other. <laughs> right, so that you choose extremely ill-behaved sheep. <laughs> or sheep that aren't used to being in a group. Because um, you're not going to have to work them. So that adds a certain... Anyway, they went to this event and my son went off to talk to some other people and leaving his Spanish girlfriend with two of these farmers, um, and when he came back, they said, oh, she's so lovely, your girlfriend, Adam. We really like your girlfriend, Adam. And she said afterwards, she said, you didn't tell me they talked a different language. <laughs> and her English is really good, really, really good. She just could not follow the accent and the idiom at all. So when one talks about place, one's talking about cultural space, as well as talking about physical space, or at least I am. And I think that most people, consciously or unconsciously, are too. Uh, so, in the light of all that, the two issues about place in contemporary writing are the split between what is technically called oikophilia, which means love of home, and the journey adventure. I sense that here, as so often in European culture, um, we're kind of seriously divided between our two root sources, um, between the classical, the classical world and the Judaic world between, to put it more simply, between the Odyssey and the book of Genesis. Um, the Odyssey is a book about, both, both books are books about journeys, books about repeated journeys, um, but they're very different journeys. Odysseus's journey is about going home to Ithaca. Um, his desire, if you like, that's so strong and so much a part of his personality that it actually keeps him safe. His desire to get home enables him to survive, survive everything. Um, his sense of place, which construct, constructs his sense of identity, is about the landscape of his home, um, of his childhood, of his memories. He says of himself that he used to, what well, he doesn't say of himself, of course, the non-existent Homer says of him, but in from what I believe in creative writing is called point of view. <laughs> from Odysseus's point of view, um, he says he used to dwell in shining Ithaca. There is a mountain there, Hyneriton, high, high, high covered in forest. Many islands lie around it, very close to each other. Dulichon, Same, and Wooded Zakynthos. But low lying Ithaca is farthest out to sea towards the sunset. It's rough, but it raises good men. Um, and this, I think, is oikophilia, which is, of course, a Greek word. Oikos means home, and philia means love of. Um, it's rough, charming that it should be a Greek word when we're talking about a Greek text, but um, there you go. Sense of place is here embodied in the writing as memory, as desire and as plot resolution. Um, he, in fact, does get home, and when he gets home, that's the end of the story. Um, the whole book is about that, that is the plot arc or dynamic. Um, writers can never, actually, especially prose writers, can never really forget about plot resolution, um, and plot resolution is embedded in that sense of place, which is the place of home. The other dimension of a sense of place can be seen in Genesis 12. Um, Abraham and Sarah are called by their God to leave your country and your family, leave your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. And at this point, which land they're going to isn't even established. It will become the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey and so on, but it's the territory of the journey to it, towards it, and the events of that journey that is at the center of this sort of sense of place. This sense of place is embedded in the very ancient ideas of quest or pilgrimage, of adventure, of courage and aspiration, and of storytelling in plot construction. You make your plot out of the events that happen rather than the resolution of returning home. Um, both I mean, both uh, uh, Odysseus and Abraham are basically mythic. They're mythic stories. Um, and 
said primary stories in that sense. There's no, absolutely no evidence for either of these characters ever really having existed. And yet they are phenomenally primary texts because in formal terms they encompass what well, actually a narrative for both poetry and prose have been endeavouring to uh, um, develop ever since, I think. Now, of course, it's much more complicated than that. What a surprise. It always is. Um, and it's complicated for a number of reasons, and here are just a few of them. It's complicated because place, especially but not exclusively in prose fiction, is so entangled with plot, with story, with what happens next, that lots of writers need and can do both uses of space, often at the same time. Um, a really good example of this is actually the role of the house and the grounds of, in Mansfield Park. Jane Austen is immensely subtle with this, because at first sight, Mansfield Park, with its profound domestic orderliness, the way all the good characters <coughs> love it, and all the bad characters find it very restrictive, restricts their badness, um, the whole way the novel starts with childhood, the negative comparison and value of all other locations, even Southerton, which is more or less identical to Mansfield Park, the consumer precision of all the descriptions, um, the blurring of inside and outside, which is very, very typical of people's remembrances of home, that home is both the building you live in and the area which is charged and explored around it. People have extraordinarily accurate memories of places where they played, um, if they were allowed to choose them in any way um, themselves, I think. Um, the blurring of inside and outside and so on make it feel like a trope of oikophilia. But in terms of the plot and indeed of the characters, it is, for the protagonists and others, absolutely the promised land. It has to be searched for and earned and found and returned to. Because, quite apart from anything else, it is not Fanny Price's home of childhood. She doesn't go there until she's 12. Um, it, she finds it, well, I think there's a really wonderful moment, a long, careful scene when she does return to her actual place of childhood and finds it terribly unsatisfactory, uncomfortable and miserable. <laughs> um, it's really very cunning, I think, in uh, Jane Austen's attempt to show that love of home and love of moral adventure can be done together, as it were. Um, another reason why it's complicated is that it would be very easy here to draw a distinction between domestic landscape and adventure or dangerous landscape or place. But actually, that's not how it works out on the page. Um, two very different writers, whose oikophiliac <laughs> places fraught with risk and peril are Emily Bronte's Lord for More in Wuthering Heights, which is so effective that we actually tend to forget that nothing happens on the moor at all. <laughs> the moor is hardly in that book. It's partly what the films have done to us, but it's partly because um, the moor has become so pervasive that you read it into the most drawing room scenes. It's really extraordinary if you don't count how much happens on the moor. It is astonishingly little. Um, but whatever else it is, it's certainly not a kind of place of calm and sweetness. Um, there's Emily Rogers in Yorkshire Moor in uh, Wuthering Heights. Um, and the other place that I think of is very, very dark is Alan Garner's um, Cheshire. Um, I mean, I think that, I think Bowland is a wonderful book, it's an incredibly good book, but it is terribly, terribly dark, but it is home for him. He said of his own writing, I had to get back to the familiar way of doing things by using skills that had been denied to my ancestors, but I had nothing that they would have called worthwhile. My ability was in language and languages. I had to use that somehow, and writing was manual craft. But what did I know that I could write about? I knew the land. Um, so in, I think Boneland is, to say nothing of the children's book, is very definitely a novel about home, about groundedness, about very deep memory for him, um, as well as being a bit bonkers. 
um, it should not be overlooked. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, Bonkers is a very light-hearted word. He's written, I think, immensely movingly about his own depressive um, wellness. Um, all I'm saying is that he's not somebody for whom home is a cosy pot of tea with a cosy on. Um, but it's still, I think, Land is for anyone a novel about oikophilia, about memory and about desire. But it <coughs> is terrible in the most literal sense of that word. Perhaps it would be worth comparing people like George Mackay Brown and R.S. Thomas, both of whom, whose poetry is profoundly infused by a sense of loved place, including culture and individuals, actually. But while Mackay Brown, even in sadness, finds beauty in joy, and an extraordinary tenderness, I think, for the Orkneys, which are not themselves a tender place, um, whereas Thomas has been described as the Alexander Solzhenitsyn of Wales, um, <laughs> because basically it's all horrible for him. <laughs> but horrible or joyful, with both of them you have a sense that they know that land and they would not be who they were without it. So it's not about dark life or comfortable or uncomfortable. Okay, the third complication, I think, is there's a small but significant group of writers for whom home is deeply problematic. Because, for one reason or another, the place or landscape um, that says home is not actually available to them. So there's a real sense of dislocation, of longing and failing to be at home. There is no plot resolution. Um, I think that's very painful in a lot of writers, especially those who are exiled or shift language, like Conrad or Nabokov. Um, Nudges written in reference to Conrad, actually. Living away from one's natural environment, family, friends, social group, language, even if it results from a conscious decision, usually gives rise to internal tensions because it makes people less sure of themselves, more vulnerable, less certain of their position and value, they strive to find confirmation of their self-regard in the eyes of others. Such a psychological heritage forms both a spur to ambition and a source of constant stress. Um, this is also true, for instance, I think of a large number of African writers because there's a split between their mother tongue and the language of education and reading, um, so that they're constantly dislocated. Um, there is, of course, now a very large group um, of uh, African writers whose mother tongue is, in fact, a European language. But I think even with them, there is a dislocation, um, because it's not the language that spontaneously belongs to the place. Um, not, of course, the language is spontaneous, you understand. Um, I think that that sense of being exiled, for whatever reasons, um, really confuses what a sense of home might be, or what a sense of adventure might be, if you're adventurously looking to find a home. Um, and finally, there are the slightly weird writers who find home or place later in life, and more or less unexpectedly. Um, John Burnside has written the most beautiful piece about going to <laughs> very, very north of Scandinavia, right up on the Arctic Rim, and finding that it's his home. Um, a very kind of gut, gut sense that this is home for him. Um, and another example would be um, John Muir, who came from Midlothian and found his home was in the mountains of the, um, of the Rockies. Um, you know, absolutely, that was home. But he didn't actually get there until he was in his 40s. I'm allowed to call them weird because, as a, um, as a piece I read, read, I'm one of them. Um, and it is quite a complicated thing to find that your home place is a place that does not come out of your childhood memories. Um, because I think it is so weird, I thought I'd read a little bit of fiction um, about it, because although this refers to a very different place, once you've had an experience, you could fictionalise it. So I'm just going to read a little bit from a short story in this book. This book, Mosswick, um, all the stories are an attempt to make extremely contemporary science into um, narrative metaphor. Uh, each of the stories has a little essay, I mean, usually a page and a half, um, a very short little essay, at the end of it, by the contemporary research scientist 
who was kind of my uh, um, my guru for, for that particular story. Um, and this one is in a story called Her Bonksy Boy, um, which uh, uh, somebody who has a rather delightful title as he is the professor of a professor of fishery development and seabirds. <laughs> I'd like to be a professor of that. Um, and it's a story about a woman who most unfortunately falls in love with a skewer. <laughs> Skewers are very large, uh, rather vicious, rather unattractive, as a matter of fact. Um, seabirds who have enormous migration patterns. Um, and, uh, um, but they always return very precisely to the place in which they were bred. And they are sight monogamous. As soon as they arrive home, both males and females, they will mate with the nearest unmated male or female to that place. So they very often have the same partner year after year, because if everybody's returning very precisely to where they started from, they're um, very likely to have the same person next year. But it turns out that that is not the basis of this at all. Um, it's, it's sight fidelity, not character fidelity. Anyway. Um, she is, uh, she is a, um, a research scientist who has a seabird um, research centre um, right out um, beyond Lewis, on a small island beyond Lewis. <coughs> um, and I carefully mark the place and I do not seem to be finding it. Okay, so she's arrived on she's arrived on the mainland, well not the mainland, she's arrived on the big island, she's got the end of the road, she's going out in a boat to this little uh, island. Um, depending on the weather and the tides, it is about a 45 minute run from the harbour to the island. The little boat smacks into the waves, but it feels more bouncy and cheerful than rough. She goes forward to the well at the bows and stands holding the rail, watching for the moment that they clear the headland north of the harbour and she will get her first sight of the island, lifting its cliffs like a beak towards the west. The business of loading had distracted and soothed her, but now her urgency returns. She barely looks at the coast or at the passing birds, only forward. After a while, Ian calls her and she forces herself to turn, smile, and make her way aft to join him in the little wheelhouse. Things are not always what they seem. Ian looks like the local boatman. Indeed, he is the local boatman. But he also has a PhD in psychology from a Russell League university down in England. He told them about it one drunken evening at the research centre about four years ago. It had been Chen's first year then, and he had hated it. He was good at the work, and probably now was confident enough to get on with it to the point of enjoying it. But that first summer had been appalling. For him. He was scared of the northern light, cold too much of the time, and darkly baffled by everyone else's enthusiasm. His beautiful, self effacing manners had really not been helpful in the strange enforced intimacy. She had suggested tentatively once that he go back to the mainland, and he had been both angry and hurt. Ian had come out on his regular supply run and it stayed overnight. Quite suddenly, and in no apparent context, he turned to Chen and said, my thesis was on home, on love of place. What makes a particular place or topography home necessary to someone, and why? Just accept that this is not your place, and you'll be fine. There had been a sudden surprise pause, and then he'd gone on, told them very briefly about his work, and finally said, as a psychologist, I want to ask why people choose to research particular things. With me, it became obvious. I learned I really couldn't live anywhere else except here. I completed the thesis, had a nervous breakdown, and came home. I've not been off the outer aisle since. I hope I never have to. He took a long slug of whiskey and added, of course, the really weird ones aren't people like me, with our own language or our own music, and our own rather particular landscape. I was especially interested in people who find home somewhere they have never been before, that they have no roots in, no story, and might go all their lives and never find it. But they do, 
a sort of instant recognition of here. And he gave her a straight, clean look. And he barely ever mentioned his past again. And finally, there's a fourth problem with my simple division. Um, and I can only call it fashion. Um, writers, all writers actually, however imbued with a sense of place, um, or even in wilderness, a part of the culture that taught them to write, and therefore most of us are, or at least have been, readers too. I stand with T.S. Eliot here, that originality is not eccentricity, but pushing out the boat, pushing out the boundaries of a tradition so that it kind of reaches into new places. So, of course, writers are affected by trends and fashions, whether we like to say, and what we actually get to read, or how we're affected by, is dependent on what publishers think is worth publishing, which generally means likely to sell. So fashion develops very fast in literary circles. And there's always going to be a fashion about how you handle place. And the, towards the middle, first half of the last century, saw a massive shift from enormously careful carefully written full descriptions of places that people didn't know about. So we have Dickens walking the streets of London, we have Scott walking the hills of uh, Scotland actually, although that's just by chance. Um, we have uh, uh, writers like Kipling, Ryder Haggard, Henry James, John Muir. They're all writing place that is not known to their readers. And then what happens? You have photography. Now, if I want to know now what a Himalaya looks like, I do not read a whole novel to find out. I go to Google Earth and see. That has completely changed the way we write about place, because we're not having to teach the readers anymore. Um, and as a matter of fact, people now go there themselves. It's very important to realise how recent this idea of travelling to places is. People made enormous fortunes. There's a wonderful story about Frank Kingdon Ward, who's a very, very good travel writer from between the wars. He's also a plant collector, actually. But, um, but the reason why he lived his life the way he did, which is somewhat odd, is that when he was about 11, um, he overheard his father and somebody else who he didn't remember later who it was talking, and somebody else said to his father, of course, there's areas up the Brahmaputra where no white person has ever been. And he said, to himself, that's what I'm going to do with my life. And he financed these rather very extraordinary expeditions, actually, by writing about them. And he could write about them, um, he wrote a little accurately, it turns out, but he needn't have done. He could say anything he wanted, because <laughs> nobody was going to go. Um, I'm sorry to go back to Jane Austen, but it is worth remembering that uh, Emma, who is extremely rich, middle class, well educated, and is just south of London, has never seen the sea. And nobody thinks that's odd. Um, that um, in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth Bennet gets really, really excited because she's going to go to Derbyshire. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, she doesn't know that she's going, there's going to be a film made that shows her the love of her life plunging itself into a lake, uh, which is not in the book anyway. She's excited because she's going to Derbyshire. Um, so uh, I think that that's made a really kind of big change for us all. Um, so, so that now, if you want to write about a place, you have to kind of imbue it with emotions, imbue it with meaning. Um, Shelley obviously started that with his Mont Blanc thing. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say Mont Blanc thing in that rather explicit way. It's a very, very fine poem. Um, and more interestingly, I think, is the Wordsworths, um, Mary and William, stomping about Somerset, pretending it's the Lake District. By the time they actually get to the Lake District, he's finished writing about that. Um, a very odd, in a way. But in all cases, the people giving the readers um, a very, very new experience, which shifts the understanding of place towards the adventure side and away from the home side. I think that's been completely reversed by the fact that we don't need fiction to access the exotic. And I myself have a suspicion that that is really um, the reason why uh, deep space sci-fi um, is so successful. We only know what there is to see because none of us have been there. 
through the way it is imagined and written by writers. Because it's actually quite a new form. Um, the early sci-fi um, is much more grounded in the real, not the real world, the world here on this planet. And this idea of going out into space is the great adventure. Um, serves writers and other narrative makers, including films, extremely well because there is this kind of fascination about what it might be like. Um, I think the same thing could apply to deep fantasy, actually. The both of those are quite newly successful genre, and they are one thing that we cannot look up on, um, on Google. Um, so I don't think... I'm going to stop, I think, um, in a rather inconclusive way. I'm going to stop by saying that in a lot of new, the new writing about place, for all these reasons, there is a shift towards writing about place emotionally responded to by the writer or by the characters of the writer, um, whatever that is. And that what we're seeing, um, and I'm thinking now of people like Kathleen Jenny, who is the best, I think, of all the new nature writers, um, Rob McFarland, um, in Sinclair, um, lots and lots of people. What we're talking about now is a new sort of way of taking on discussion of nation in place, which is much more to do um, with autobiography of home territory, of that strange balance, I think, of knowledge with love. Um, and that's pulled the two ways of approaching it, I think, closer together. I think that's what I want to say. Thank you.